I would like to introduce you, Dr. Muhammad Mazar Hussain, uh, another veteran in the field of uh, imparting education. Uh, he has completed his uh, UG in Loyola College and holds a degree in PG and MPhil from New College. And uh, he has served in this institution, the institution of Muhammad Sada College of Art and Science for more than nine years. He has guided many UG and PG students to excel in their career. Provided he is an active member of many academic and departmental activities. And I'm very happy to invite Professor Muhammad Mazar Hussain to take over the stage. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you both, sir, for uh, giving a wonderful appreciation and presentation on me. I thank the Bahamas of the College of Arts and Science and also the Cape Comorian uh, Trust for organizing such kind of conference and uh, inducting me as a chairperson for the session too. So now I'm going to start the second session. So, Dr. H.K. Ja. Yes, yes, I'm available. I'm available. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm available. H.K. Ja, yeah, wait, wait. Dr. H.K. Ja is a, works in the Amit School of Liberal Arts, Amit University, Gurgaon. Gurgaon, Gurgaon, Haryana. Gurgaon, yeah. Title of the paper is A Study of Powerful Female Characters in J.M. Court Says Discreet. Yes, sir, you can start presenting. Yes, your yes, papers. yes. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, um, can I open my camera because it is not opening from this side, you know? I would like to open the camera, you know. Am I, am yes, I audible, sir? Yes, you're audible. I would like, to open, yeah, I would like open. to open my camera, you know. But it is yeah, not please. opening. But it is not opening from my side, you know. Okay. You can present. Uh, I can present, you know, but, but I would like my camera to open so that, I, you know, I can, my face is visible to everybody, you know. Is it possible? Okay. But you it is not from open. your. You have but to do your open. from your phone, from your uh, set, mobile. You have to do it. You cannot do anything. Sir. Can I start? Can I start? Yeah, you can start. Can I start? Yes, yes. It's. it's I okay. want, uh, just wait a minute, sir. Listen to the present is. You have to present your. Uh, ten to twelve minutes. Duration is ten to twelve. Okay. Yeah, I, can Fine. I will finish in 10 minutes. You know. I will finish in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. My, uh, my, 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 my name, everybody knows, you know, my name is Dr. H. K. Jha. I have been working, you know, for a long time in, in Haryana, Gurgaon. And uh, the, 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 the title of that is Study of the Powerful Female Characters, you know. The reason that I have chosen this, this particular and fascinating topic is because, you know, I have been fascinated by the powerful female characters of the Shakespeare plays beginning from you know Porcia in, in, in Merchant of Venice, rather, you know, going towards you know Desdemona, Lady Macbeth, Cordelia, you know, all these, you know, Cleopatra, you know, all these characters have fascinated me a lot. And when I read this, you know, beautiful novel for the first time about 20 years back, you know, you know, these this these characters, you know, completely, you know, uh, fascinated me. So I have made a study, you know, um on this. And you know, uh, you know, I made a lot of literature study. And you know, most of the people have you know have focused on, on racial discrimination and you know the character development of that particular protagonist you know that 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 David Lurie you know but this the limitation of this novel is that this paper is that it is focused only on the four important female characters you know. the female the important female characters are uh, 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 sorry yeah uh, um, um, Isaac Melanie uh, Lucy and you know Bev Shaw these are the four important female characters available in the novel you know and you know uh, there are four important female characters available in the novel and you know all of them you know are very powerful the meaning of power that i would like to define myself you know is that you have a choice in your hand you know and you know you can take decisions and you can have the courage and you have the power to implement the decisions you know so this this is the framework you know let me explain one by one the four characters you know the first important character is suraya you know suraya is a prostitute you know she is about 30 years old and uh, the protagonist, you know, spends two hours every Thursday with her, you know, and they talk a lot. They are quite comfortable, you know, in the company of each other. In the company of each other, you know, they are quite comfortable, you know. And, uh, 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 you know, and, uh, you know, David thinks, the person, the protagonist thinks that, you know, um, he can do whatever he wants with her. So he, you know, they meet, you know, in the dark of hotel and Surya is a prostitute that has been provided by the escort agency to him. But you know, she 
discourages him that she would not meet you know but one day in the in the in the <clears throat> in the market you know uh, they somehow meet and from the next thursday suriya said that she will not come again to you and she didn't david you know collected all the information about her through a detective agency and gives her a phone call that you know can we meet outside suriya gives a curt reply that do not give me a phone call and do not disturb my privacy you know and after that the relationship gets broken this was one character she did what she wanted that is a hypothetical ethical framework she did what she she didn't allow you know david or male folk to manipulate her she didn't allow you know to get manipulated by the main character this was one very important second important you know uh, david lurie you know is a professor in cape town technical university and he's about 52 years old and he has the arrogance that he was a white man you know that he can manipulate any woman you know, or seduce any woman the second impact suriya must be about you know 30 years old i think or 32 years old the second important female character that we have is is isaac milley you know. isaac milley is a young student you know, young young girl of about 19 or 20 years something she is very comely and she was a student in the class of david david lurie you know. uh, and you know one day you know he meets her and he started following her and somehow he seduced his husband you know. and you know one thing leads to another you know and then they start meeting and talking and spending time together but you know one day yeah um, uh, uh, milani asked that you know do you collect the photographs then he said no no i don't collect the photographs i'm not in the business of collecting photographs i don't collect anything i don't collect women she again asked aren't you collecting me he says no i'm not collecting me so at that moment you know the relationship was broken you know and then she gets a revenge she sends her boyfriend you know and you know then a lot of things happened you know and he had to lose his job you know, he had to lose all his but still that arrogance was still there in the character of david lurie you know and you know um, isaac milney was expecting some kind of emotional connective some kind of you know the person taking responsibility and uh, david lurie was not like that the third you know after that he loses his job the professor in the cape town technical university his pension benefits were you know confiscated and then he goes you know 250 kilometers away from cape town uh, to a place where his daughter lives lucy you know lucy is again a young woman of 30 years and she is a lesbian and she is an independent woman you know and there he starts spending time with lucy his own daughter and talks many things and one evening you know lucy gets raped you know by the native africans you know the black people ruffian black people come and you know they assault her you know, in front of david david was locked in the laboratory and you know and you know david wanted her to leave the place david wanted her to sell the land and go to a different place but she refused she strongly said that she was not going to be dominated by her by her father you know it is her life you know and she would like to live the way she wants you know she didn't sell her own land she didn't leave the place and you know she she decided to stay there and she did also decided to get married to her own caretaker you know petrus who had become now become very powerful because it was the it was the land now which was being ruled by the white people because the white sorry black people white people had left already the fourth character is you know bev shaw you know she's a married woman lives with her husband and she runs a dog clinic in the same village salem it is known as the salem you know. and in that particular village you know she runs a dog clinic she was not very attractive in looking according to david um, and you know somehow she gets an opportunity you know and it was she who has seduced him you know in when one sunday afternoon in one of the dark corners of the dog clinic you know. now the question is that if you analyze all these four characters you know see that you know the first two ladies suriya and milni they were they were the black ladies you know the native africans and you know the other two ladies for example lucy and bev shaw they were the white ladies you know. and you know all these characters have forced david to accept the rent suriya stopped meeting milani took the revenge you know lucy refused to follow his dictates and you know that um, bev shaw you know um, had had her own way you know in one one sunday afternoon and you know somehow you know for example these people significant these women have played a very significant role they didn't change they they maintained their stand you know, and they proved that they were not vulnerable they are very very powerful and they can force you know men not to you know not to they, uh, they didn't allow men to be manipulated after that you know something what happens that david you know becomes a different man all together you know these experiences were very important in making you know the real uh, character thing and the redemption comes to the main character you know. so what exactly i want to prove and what what i want to argue you know that is the main argument of this paper that i have worked on that you know that uh, that that 
women are not vulnerable you know they are powerful they can take their own decisions and they can they can they can protect themselves and they may not be manipulated you know the on the contrary um, um, thinking of the you know opinion that women are weak and women can be manipulated and can be seduced very easily so this is the argument that i have worked on thank you very much thank you very much this was the presentation that i have done okay thank you thank you dr hk ja okay now one question sir yeah is this novel jane court says novel disgrace is against the male domination not exactly against the male domination you know but this is this novel is actually you know to show the man that you cannot do everything you know for example you know you cannot okay. you, you can have you know sometimes you know your own way with some women but you cannot seduce and you cannot manipulate all the women you know? this is number one number two this that this this novel is to teach a lesson to this 52 year old professor that look respect your age and finally the redemption has come if you read for example the first uh, paragraph and if you read the last paragraph you can see a lot of character development in this novel in this character okay thank you sir thank you thank you uh, next uh, person to present is james raj james raj are you here james raj yes good morning good afternoon sir good afternoon yeah, james raj is a research scholar from department of english sir tagore college chennai and his title is manuring elements of diaspora and the impact in philip frots in english okay you can continue start okay so good afternoon good afternoon everyone so afternoon. at the outset i would like to thank uh, uh, the college for providing me this opportunity so i am going to do on a topic you know one of the contemporary novelists who recently died in 2018 was philip roth a postmodern american novelist his uh, 29th novel okay indignation so i'll give you a short gist of the novel basically this novel deals with a student you know mr uh, messner his story you know he was uh, you know is uh, the year is 1950s uh, 1950 51 the korean war and the marcus messner who was to decides to pursue his higher studies while working in his father's butcher shop butcher shop yeah during the you know during the college his first year but he feels that you know he feels that he is not comfortable and he wants to get rid of that his father's obsessive concern from you know that you know that situation and he transfers himself to uh, winesburg a small ohio school college university uh, college right based on his uh, you know his catalog photograph you know he was selected right and then he decides to become you know excellent studies both to earn his uh, you know to way to law school and later you know to you know that is to avoid being you know uh, drafted into the korean war which was going on you know between 1951 to 53 right and finally whether he succeeds in establishing himself there right yeah in that sense whether he was able to do that or whether he was uh, you know so drafted into the war and uh, whether he was you know Uh, whether he had to go and fight and whether he survives and that is the plot outline and here we can see that you know the whole uh, you know the story deals with you know we are going at to i am looking at the traces of you know the elements of diaspora right and i think basically we every every one of us know what is basically diaspora means right diaspora could mean you know in today i am not getting into the the origin okay we can go back to the you know the 16th uh, 6th century bc when you know originally you know kingdom of israel israelites were you know driven away and in today's term we could say that it could be forced you know forced you know separation from their homeland settled in other countries okay it could happen to because of immigration natural causes war natural disaster and at the end of the core of that you know how these diasporic people they go and settle and they become they try to accommodate and you know they assimilate with the you know the given culture yeah so it comes from the origin uh, you know the greek word okay you know it refers to the scattering of those greeks yeah so in that sense we are going to look at what are the characteristics what we find you know the diasporic element in this novel yeah so if you look at uh, you know philip roth an american novelist right he's a very well known uh, novelist in fact one of the top most uh, postmodern novelists you know those who are alive along with comet mccarthy and uh, don didillo and others right so he's a well known figure and third generation a uh, jew immigrant settled in new york right and we find that uh, this uh, you know is issue of you know uh, his uh, issue of jewish origin and his conflict with the religion is uh, atheism and we find this aspect you know classes in most of his novels sometimes it 
you know it goes beyond his novel whatever is prescribed and sometimes even into his non fictional work right and sometimes you know most of the time you know he has a protagonist a kind of an alter ego in most of his novels there are you know four set of novels where you know is very famous uh, you know the alter ego protagonist you know mr zuckerberg right in that series but this novel is one of you know the last series nemesis series okay so there are four novels based on this nemesis series and this is the second most novel of that in fact you know 29th novel after that he wrote two more novels on that right so we are going to look at in what way this aspect you know uh, we find so as we can see so uh, in that sense uh, the diasporic element right so if you look at uh, we can see that the when you know uh, those element can be found in this novel of uh, you know philip roth's novel uh, indignation right so here we find marcus messner you know he feels quite discomfort in the multiple facets you know of our being displaced from the different state of ohio to the place of winesburg for his higher studies right and we find you know how he is unable to adjust himself to the rigid norms of the institutions right and uh, we see that whether he is able to assimilate and adjust and finally settle or whether the so called punishment was given to him and whether he gets into that and was unable to come out of that right so basically we know about uh, you know about diaspora so this uh, this 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 slide talks about the basics of diaspora right and it this paper uh, actually tries to construct that so it comes from you know the whole uh, umbrella term you know under under the post colonial theory we know that you know this term comes from that and in today's sense if you look at the modern definition of uh, uh, you know uh, 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 modern definition of diaspora could include right even uh, it protagonist or the person has been has been uprooted and the ways through which both physical geographical ways through which the person takes into the new land for example if you take the case of you know now the ukrainian war is going on right so there are people those who migrate to other countries in a way in a way, in a way for better prospect they may not take the same route which the person you know those who are going to take those who are taking at this you can see you know mass migration of people towards the west towards the belarus and towards poland right so there could be different route both geographically both physically right and uh, so in that sense it comes to the question of assimilation and how they get accommodated in the new 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 country right so in that sense if you look at it, it is a kind of a class based migration you know in general and a kind of a condition of a displacement right amongst the people right so we can see that it has happened voluntarily and because of even even for the reasons such as uh, it could be even even it could be because of war and other 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 reasons for this mass migration right so this mi mass migration we can see as i mentioned you know the present day the war which is going on and even you know the history talks about like you know war in iraq and syria right how thousands of you know refugees have been displaced to hostile condition and they had to go we saw the very iconic images of you know how a very small boy was drawn while crossing the agency around sometime 2015 and 16 right so the latter talks about what kind of a preference they do right so we shall note an important point here right in fact most of the countries you know those who accommodating countries they are not welcoming right they are not hospitable most of the time right because of their their own you know uh, you know internal conflict right so in that sense uh, 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 one of the you know uh, very well known scholar on uh, diaspora himadri lahari talks about it describes it's a diaspora is a social formation outside the nation of origin it is a phenomenon involving uprooting forced or voluntarily right a mass number mass of people from their homeland to their rooting and to the host land so one thing we have to assume that in modern context diaspora does not mean that you have to go to another country right in a, even in a country within india like we have a diverse you know uh, you know cultural and other diversity diaspora could happen within india also right or even within the state right when this accommodation assimilation is different right within a particular state also and india is a very varied one right so this traditional assumption of the diaspora refers to when people migrate to geographically you know politically a different country is not accepted so in today's sense if that is the latest one that is the it could be even uh, you know uh, when people migrate for their own 
voluntarily and economic and other prospect right so keeping this in mind so in that sense if you look at this if you come come to the story of you know the plot outline of dias uh, you know the uh, the theme which it concerns with this novel indignation so we see marcus he you know voluntarily steps to uh, you know get into uh, you know he gets out of from that particular uh, you know college and goes to weinsberg a small liberal art science engineering college at ohau right and uh, where we find that you know you know it is almost 500 miles away from his place he feels suffocated there right because of the very condition that you know that happening since he was an atheist you know he finds himself you know very difficult to adjust to the situation where compulsory you know uh, prayer and mass was very important one right so in that sense we see that uh, you know from a jewish background right how what are the difficulty he faces uh, he faces there right so this lead this leads us to understand what kind of a you know the complaint not just his father right the dominating father you know when he was in native place to that of a as a freshman in a new college okay in a new uh, new college where is in unable to adjust right and we find how you know uh, the issues we find that two of his you know roommates right it leads to a, a situation where he is unable to adjust with two roots roommates and he is driven away uh, you know and finally put in a kind of a giving an illusion of you know jane eyre's red room in that sense we can say he has been sent to a, a hostel or the so called hall where no one is you know no one is uh, in fact welcomed right so so in that sense so we see that uh, uh, in that sense it is a very voluntary one so this residence is called as if you know this uh, the nail hall what we call it yes so in that sense finally we find that he is unable to adjust himself and uh, uh, we little we know little about you know the the tolerance attitude of the college right and in fact the dean also meets with him and he you know he gets along with him and tries to understand his problem he has a girlfriend also right and when he comes to know about uh, you know the difficulties of that girlfriend her past and you know and the relationship also breaks away and finally we find that neither is able to adjust with his father nor with his girlfriend nor even either with those two classmates nor to this rigid atmosphere of the college and finally later the is night you know is is uh, worst nightmare you know is white na and white worst nightmare of you know he was sent to korean war right and in fact in novel we find that he comes and you know as a is in in after life he comes and he talks and narrates this story right okay so with this we can see that uh, you know so in fact uh, if he had adjusted to this the new situation right whether with his girlfriend or the classmates or in the hostel or with the dean right even the one of the biggest issue was you know his discussion is debate with the with the dean of the college on you know on atheism right finally we find that uh, is unable to adjust and is what nightmare of you know was sent to korean war and we find that in korean war he has been you know in fact he dies it dies and uh, this whole uh, plot this whole story is narrated from as if you know from after life he comes and speaks on that right so this is the in this when in this context we can uh, see that you know the great influence of you know how is whole concept of fear is ideologies ultimately you know leads to you know uh, this you know this, this terror or this uh, you know this uprooting of himself from 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 the particular particular context or particular you know the university which he has selected so despite knowing yeah the learning all these tough tough lessons you know if if he finds unable right unable to adjust and in fact he is failed right and we we find you know this context this whole novel you know this element of diaspora and we can say you know it talks about the, the aspect of those who volunteer to go to another country. Yeah, and in, in, and in fact that, uh, unless this whole issue of you know the accommodating country subjective cases and how they accommodate and they become liberal and accommodate this displaced person this whole diasporic 
you know, feeling of, you know, attaching and becoming one with the, you know, emigrated country will never happen, right? And that is what we find in this novel. So that is the whole gist of the novel, and that is the, one of the one of the themes element which uh, I, I try to bring out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James Raj. A question to you. The protagonist of the story is Marcus. Yes, no. Is he is he suffering? Because he's an immigrant, or he's from belong to a minority religion, wherever he stays. Ah, yes, yes. We cannot pinpoint that. Of course, uh, minority. Of course, Jew was one reason. Another reason could be his own. Uh, you know, his father's dominating attitude. In spite of not committing any kind of mistake, any kind of uh, the so-called ill behavior, is he was he was almost uh, his father was so dominating. That is another thing. And the third one, the accommodative nature of. Either the girlfriend or the two is classmate, and this rigid atmosphere of atmosphere of the college itself, where prayer and recitation of you know uh, uh, religious sermon was necessary in the, the sophomore year, and that was against his belief of you know Button Russell's idea of athe you know as an atheist. And in fact, there's a great debate almost for 25 pages in the novel where he literally you know proves himself you know that you know argumentatively that. You know how he justifies that. You know, you know, in that famous debate with the dean. Yeah. So we could say there could be multiple reasons for this whole behavior. And this, anyway, and the core point is the accommodative culture. Those, you know, those who welcome these immigrant, right? Even unwelcomed guests, they are not accommodative. So that is the core one we find. So it is, it is a conflicting one in that sense. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, James sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shankar, are you present in the conference, sir? Dr. B. Shankar, Dr. B. Shankar, I would like to call upon our next participant, Devika Nepram, Research Scholar, Department of History from Manipur University. She is going to present us a paper on the influence of Silk Road on Manipur's economy and polity. A fitting title for a girl, Silk Road. Of course, it's very charming. Um, Ms. Devika Nepram? I welcome you to take the stage. <laughs> Ms. Devika Nepra. Ms. Devika Nepra. Are you here with us? Ms. Devika Nepra. And uh, I do suppose that uh, we have our presence in this conference, but uh, perhaps she's facing some technical issues. Devika Nepram. Okay, sir. All right. 
I think we can move on to the next participant, MD Abdul Aziz, Research yes. Fellow, Department of Arabic, Assam University in Sucha. Okay. Ms. Devika Napram, could you please uh, wait until this session? Yes, we have been waiting on the session. Uh, due to some technical uh, indifference, I could uh, take the call. Can I present? Abdul Aziz, wait. Abdul Aziz, Research Fellow, Department of Arabic, Assam yes, University. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I would. Uh, I invite you to take on the stage, sir. You can present your paper now. The title of your paper is Thought and Works of Gibran Khalil Gibran, a study, right? Yes, sir. Everyone. Yes, sir. You can start with your presentation. Yes, yes. I'm Abdul Aziz. Department of I am Abdul Aziz, Arabic Department. Yes, I am Abdul Aziz, Mr. Scholar, Department of Arabic, Asian University. Now I am going to present my, my paper, Modern Works of Jivan Kulil Jibran, a study. The present work. The present work, thought, and works of Gibran Khalil Gibran a study, Gibran's master's piece, The Prophet, is 28 chapters, prose poem full of philosophical ideas, representing knowledge of a prophetic status. Each chapter in the Prophet is in a feeling complete in itself. It uh, presents Gibran's view on various aspects of he, uh, aspects of life or other problems of universal universal interest. Gibran Khalil Gibran present an imaginary and uh, works in his works. His philosophical messages are taken taken from all religions people al mustafa wish for regarding al mustafa wish for guidance thought teaching and support motivate motivate his followers as well as people around the world to from the ideal socio political philosophical and moral thought of god his message is spread everywhere well fully, well fully by his readers and followers. About the book, An-Nabi An published 1923. An-Nabi 
is Zibran's literary and artistic masterpiece. It remained during the 20th century American best selling book after the Bible. In 1998, it, it has sold 90 lakhs copies in North America alone. The book's chapter did well the universal themes of all aspects of life, love, pain, marriage, children, freedom, etc. It has been translated into the into at least 20 languages and has been become one of the greatest greatest classics of our time. The book is said to be a testimony to the genius of Gibran. The book presents Gibran was a writer or prophetic vision who share his spiritual test, spiritual sensitivities with his readers. Gibran's major works, major works of Gibran Khalil Gibran. One way of understanding and other consists the deciphering his thought, his uh, thoughts through his works. After all, book a book is a perfect self project projection projection of the philosophy of the uh, of the personality discuss ambition and uh, and forcefully of the writer in good philosophy in go, uh, in good philosophical language it is it is said that there is a revision of profanity nearly it uh, if not identity between the cause the product the producer and uh, and producer and if affect the product zibrans wrote his books two languages at first he wrote in arabic language then he wrote the english language also his book uh, his works are divided as fellow follows al arwa al mutamar al arwa al mutamarrida al azniha al mutagassira al mawasif al awakif al awasif the madman the madman 20 wings social philosophy so philosophy is is the is, philosophy is the study of general and fundamental problems concerning matters such as the nature knowledge truth justice beauty mind and language philosophy is the root of all knowledge social philosophy is one of the main and important branches of philosophy it is the thoughtful consideration of human society it gives insight into the actual activities of a human being in the society a social philosopher tries to study society from philosophical point of view and tries to find out the link between human society and the uh, basic nature of nature of reality conclusion after analyzing the multiple points of simil similarity and analogy in Gibran's literary works, works, it can be concluded that Gibran is a Gibran is a transcendentalist as he overcome overcome material wants and transcends them to a higher more higher mode of existence here again the spiritual and mystical elements in the writings of Gibran playing an important role in de defining and understanding his works and study his work and status by by 
campaigning relevant uh, aspects of his work, the uh, transcendence writings, the art, art, the article ex, explore important uh, dimension of the Gibran corps. The my presentation is over. Is over. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Abdul Aziz. And uh, I would like to ask you a very simple question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, among all the philosophies of uh, the great Nabi Galil Gibran, yes, yes. which one do you think is still applicable to the humans of the modern society? In the modern society, which philosophy of Gibran is practically applicable, which they can use. In, sir, in uh, our society, in in, in modern uh, our society also modern society, and uh, his famous books, uh, the Prophet and Nabi, is uh, Gibran's uh, discuss so, uh, social poor person and uh, injustice and uh, this this is uh, uh, applicable uh, applicable in uh, now in our society thank you sir thank you abdul aziz <coughs> thank you for the presentation now i would like to invite ms devika nepram research scholar department of history manipur manipur university uh, your topic is influence of Silk Route on Manipur's economy and polity, a fitting title for a woman to discuss. It's based on silk. Okay. Yeah. Miss yeah. Devika Nepram. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, this is me, uh, uh, Devika Nepram from uh, Manipur University, and I'm doing my PhD from Manipur University. Uh, so the uh, today's topic is entitled "Influence of Silk Route on Manipur's Polity and Economy." Uh, the Silk Route was believed to have originally originated from China and it got its name mainly due to the trade that was carried out mainly for silk. Uh, we have uh, learned that uh, the Silk Route it tras trespassed through various countries like uh, China, then it advanced on to India and then it reached Central Asia and then it came over to the Middle East countries like uh, Iran, Iraq and then uh, it uh, advanced further to Africa and then finally to Europe. Uh, as quoted by R. Dawson in his book, The Legacy of China, it ran overland to the west from North China through the modern Xinjiang across the Pamirs to the northern Iran and on to Syria and the Mediterranean with a branch southward to India from the upper, upper Oxus. So basically in this part, I've uh, um, explained the uh, route through which the Silk Route traversed. So, uh, furthermore, silk was basically a luxurious, uh, exquisite material woven into clothes that was used mainly by the royal families. And uh, if, we were, if, if we were to understand further uh, how silk is obtained, silk is obtained from the cocoon of the silkworm where the filaments were extracted from the cocoons by dipping in water in ancient times. This was in ancient times, but uh, in modern period, like we have uh, come across using of uh, 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 gadgets or machines to extract the silk from the silk cocoon. So uh, in the next part of the uh, uh, my paper, I'll be discussing on uh, which suggests evidences of silk route uh, passing through Manipur. So first, uh, I'll be taking uh, accounts of uh, various authors, then various historians, uh, then even uh, these Britishers who came. So uh, first, uh, it, it is uh, an account given by Sir jo uh, James Johnstone, where he uh, told that it was basically the Chinese who taught the art to the Manipur, uh, the art of re rearing silk to Manipur, and it was believed that in the year 1250 AD, 
the Chinese, they had come to invade Manipur. And in this war, the Manipuris were ultimately defeated. And the Chinese, uh, they assimilated into the Maiti society where uh, they uh, uh, entered into matrimonial alliance with the people uh, and they uh, settled down there. So this is the first account. And uh, coming to another account given by a British uh, historian, he says, uh, the process related to silk culture was performed by a class called Kubo, which is derived from the word Kabo in Upper Burma. And uh, the Burmese who came to Manipur, they bought all the raw silk from Manipur and then uh, they, import, uh, they exported this silk to their kingdom. Then uh, we have another account by another uh, Britisher where he mentions that uh, the silk clothes that was made in Manipur, where they were highly priced in neighboring countries like Ava, Ava, which, uh, which is Burma. And this is taken from the book, R.B. Pemberton's book, Eastern Frontier of British India. Then uh, coming to another book uh, by a, a, a writer named H.F. Saman. And uh, his book is entitled Monograph on the Cotton Fabrics of Assam. The, uh, in this book, he explains the trade that was carried out between Assam and the neighboring foreign countries like Burma, then even with Europe, which facilitated the, the trade of Manipur. Then uh, we have uh, also another account by uh, an Assamist writer uh, by P. Gogoi. In his book, The Thai and the Thai Kingdom, he mentions that uh, the uh, Asmis boundary expanded over the sands, over the Mekong, that is the Asian region, then Menam, which is the Thailand region, and then even over in parts of Manipur. So uh, the, basically, the Burmese had tried to uh, held a control over Assam in this time. Uh, it was mainly for political con conquest, but uh, like uh, coming over to the region, they uh, had this trade be benefits, which could be uh, taken mainly from silk. So uh, this is uh, these are some of the authors which uh, talks about the silk route passing through Manipur. Then another uh, famous historian by the name of John Key in his book uh, entitled A Legacy of China. He mentions about a place called Dayonu, uh, spelling is D-I-A-N-Y-U-E, uh, uh, which, uh, which is Burma only. Uh, and he talks that uh, uh, mention, mention of Burma is uh, mentioned in this book. Uh, then even uh, uh, India, is, uh, India is mentioned as uh, the uh, land of Sindhu, which, may, which is derived from the Indus River. So basically, we can understand that uh, Burma, then India, and uh, 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 China, they had trade relations then which advanced uh, from Burma to Manipur. So these are the evidences that Silk Road passed through Manipur. So uh, then after, after this, coming to the main main chapter of my paper, it will focus on the uh, economy and polity of Manipur, how the Silk, uh, silk Route affected the, uh, uh, the economic and political life of the people. Uh, so I'll take up firstly on the economy. Uh, it affected mainly the uh, handloom and handicraft industry. Handloom and handicraft industry basically uh, like uh, it focused on the weaving, on the rearing and the cultivation of silk. So uh, uh, this occupation mainly sustained the livelihood of the people in the ancient days. And even, even uh, till now, this uh, culture survives even up to this day. Then, uh, then there were other uh, uh, jobs like uh, which pertain to the uh, handicraft industry like dyeing, painting, uh, painters, they were employed in this industry, which further enlarged the uh, handloom and handicraft industry. Then second, uh, there was the rise in uh, job expertise where people were employed according to their skills and labor. As such, there was the rise of job specialization and distribution. Then coming to the third point, Silk Route passed through various states and countries, and the main items of import and export were silk, 
Then another uh, uh, fabric that was exported was uh, cotton. Then fruits even were exported. Then even pony, pony uh, horses, uh, uh, the Manipuri horses, uh, they were considered to be the finest horses in uh, um, in 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 the entire Northeast. And even the Burmese, they took these horses uh, to China through the Silk Road. So uh, it opened better channels for communication. Thus, trade and commerce was uh, easily facilitated. Then another point is it served as a uh, uh, source of uh, income for the state as the income generated from the various workforce that was got from inside and outside the state, uh, like mainly from the weaving industry, the handloom and handicraft industry, then uh, the job specialization, then this paved the way for generating income that could be utilized by the people. So this is, uh, these are the uh, effects that it had on the economic life of the people. And another uh, point that I would like to focus is uh, how the Silk Road affected the political life of the people. First, uh, it helped in expansion of the territories. With the coming of the Silk Road and in, uh, in the motive of expanding kingdom, wars were fought between the uh, neighboring states and the countries. Then we have a uh, record in uh, uh, a British account of E.W. Dun in his book, Gazetteer of Manipur, whereby he mentions that during King Kyamba, uh, uh, he reigned in the 14th century, a joint alliance was fought between Manipuri king and Manipur, uh, Myanmar king uh, by the name of Chaupa Kikumba, where he invaded Kyang, uh, uh, which was a Shan principality of Kabo Valley. And this is how Kabo Valley uh, became Manipur's territory after this war. So this was the main impact. Then uh, another, like, uh, it had, uh, like, uh, was a war where fought with uh, Burma, uh, then Shan, which is the Pong Kingdom, then Kabo, Tripura, uh, then Kashar, uh, then Assam, then uh, Upper Assam, etc. Then this, uh, these are the uh, territorial expansion uh, which spread to um, uh, the uh, neighboring states and countries. And then uh, another effect was like uh, due to the uh, coming of the Silk Road, even the Buddhist mis missionary from Burma, they came in the court of King Maputhiba of Angum clan. Then uh, another point that I would like to highlight in the uh, how the polity affected uh, uh, the uh, how the uh, Silk Road affected the quality of the place was that it helped uh, in bringing about a cultural revolution. Why? Why? Uh, why a cultural revolution? Because uh, exchange were had between between various countries like uh, uh, Burma, then European countries, then even with the neighboring states like Assam, then Tripura, etc. So there was uh, then even with China also. So there was the amalgamation of the culture of the East and the West, which means like uh, different cultures came about and they uh, try to bring about a synthesis and bring about a unique culture, a, a unique identity of its own. And uh, this is explained in uh, uh, one of um, a Manipuri historian's book, uh, uh, The Maite Society by uh, Bir Chandra. Then, uh, Coming over to the another point of the uh, uh, what political impact felt was uh, there were matrimonial alliance between the uh, countries. Uh, say for because of the coming of the Silk Road, the uh, Chinese they came over, then the Assamese, then the Burmese they came over, and then uh, matrimonial alliance was set up uh, in the process of carrying out trade, and they were amalgamated into the society. Then the, the Chinese people married the locals, and they uh, finally settled down in the place. So this was a process of enhancing the uh, political uh, area of the state. Then uh, the last point that I would like to highlight is like uh, political ties were uh, enhanced through trade because uh, most of the articles uh, that were traded were silk, horse, 
then uh, even uh, horse uh, coming back to horses uh, manipur is said to be one of the uh, is said to be the birthplace uh, where uh, sagol kangje or polo polo the famous game of polo uh, uh, is attributed to so during those times games were played between the europeans and the indians so thus it was a uh, what do you say like uh, for enhancing the political political ties of the place so it was more of a give and take relationship so these are basically the points that i would like to highlight on how the silk route had its effect on the uh, economy and the polity of the place so i would like to conclude my paper with this with this thank you devika it um, was uh, a well made research it was really wonderful you have done an extensive research in this uh, particular uh the concept of silk road i have mm -hmm. a very very small question i don't want to prolong mm -hmm. uh do you think that uh, uh, from your words what i have observed is that the silk road has improved the economy of manipur and also the rest of the country mm -hmm. uh magnanimously but mm -hmm. uh, there could uh, the difference between that particular time do you think the i mean like uh, do you think that there is a great difference from the utility of silk route then mm -hmm. and uh, completely abandoning it now it does it have an impact if at all the my question is that if at all the silk route is still open do you think the economy would be still really higher we would be having more income uh yeah even uh, in the ancient days it was mainly this uh, route that facilitated the, the trade and commerce but uh, uh but with those days uh, the trade and commerce was facilitated in stages so there was development yes. there okay so i think even if the silk road is prolonged even now it would be a uh, 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 what you say an improvement of really more of beneficial uh, uh, beneficial and very lucrative uh, uh, thank yeah, you yeah. thank you so much devika uh -huh, and thank you. thank you so much yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.